In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, today, uh, May 26th, uh, is the feast day of St. Philip Neri, a uh, very great saint indeed uh, in the 16th century, uh, and he's been called, uh, or he is called, uh, the second apostle of Rome after St. Peter himself. Uh, so he had quite a remarkable life and achieved uh, quite remarkable uh, success for the Lord. He was born to a noble uh, family in Florence, Italy, and as a young man was educated by uh, Dominican friars. And later in life, he would say that um, all the progress, or rather most of the progress he made in life was due to two of them in particular, these two particular Dominican monks. He said he owed almost everything. And so we'll see later how important that was, uh, right? The, 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 um, we we'll even call that the teamwork of the church is we just never know those little children that we affect or those people that we help or a good example that we give. It seems like life is usual, but who knows that the example we set uh, may cause to rise up in the church a very great saint. So um, I would say that we, we do celebrate the feast day of St. Philip Neri, but at his own admonition, let's not forget those two Dominicans who gave him that very good education and example. Well, as a young man, he was sent to work at his uncle's business, uh, which he was to inherit, which was a sizable fortune. Uh, but very soon he realized he just had no interest in the things of the world. And so he left Florence, he left the, the family business, and he went to Rome, where he worked as a private tutor for children. And also he, he furthered his own studies under uh, some Augustinian monks there. And for the next 17 years, 17 years, St. Philip Neri would work among the sick and the poor. He would visit people in their homes. Uh, he would help the people on the streets, uh, the, the ladies of ill repute and so on, try to escape that way of life. Uh, all of this uh, he was doing as a layman. He was not a priest uh, uh, for some time, as, as I mentioned, 17 years he worked as a layman before he was finally ordained a priest. And during this time when he was working, uh, early on in, in these endeavors, he met St. Ignatius of Loyola, uh, the, newly, the founder of that, that newly formed uh, Jesuits. And so uh, to this order, he would send young men whom he'd uh, converted or worked with or among his disciples. That was his, uh, we would say, um, source for vocations. He would send them to that, the Jesuits, St. Ignatius, uh, for their priesthood. Um, eventually, he himself would be ordained a priest, and he would found an order called the Oratorians. And this is still uh, very much active today. Uh, and this was um, a very, uh, actually, this is a very new thing in the church. It was actually revolutionary in, in a good way what he was doing, his model. Um, in fact, um, the fraternity of St. Peter uh, our society of apostolic life is based on somewhat on the model of St. Philip Neri's oratory. And now what was that, right? What is an oratory? So the way that St. Philip Neri would, would evangelize and preach is he would, he would just be out among the people. He would, he would gather them and talk to them and preach to them. And there were sometimes that he would go to a different church every single day and would preach in these different churches. Uh, but he would found, we would say, societies or clubs, and they would meet in a particular place or a church or whatever, and they would call it an oratory. And then they would have, they would come together and they would sing some so hymns or songs or whatever it may be. Uh, he would do some scripture readings, some readings from the fathers, and then give an exposition or a spiritual talk um, uh, to, to those who were gathered. And this was very, very popular. Uh, and <clears throat> perhaps uh, because one of his disciples uh, was a composer of music. And so this disciple of St. Philip's Neri's would compose uh, music for the oratorians. Uh, and this composer was named Palestrina. So perhaps that may have had something to do with why he was popular. Um, he knew um, another, let's see, someone else he was familiar with. So he knew Palestrina. He was sending people to the Jesuits to St. Ignatius of Loyola himself. Um, Caesar Baronius, uh, who was, uh, after whom is called Baronius Press, a church historian. He was one of um, uh, uh, St. Philip's disciples, as well as, there was somebody else, um, Francis Borgia, another one, right? A cardinal of the church, uh, very influential. So all these men, all these men are attracted to St. Philip Neri's oratories and his method and style of evangelizing. 
Um, and, and that was, we would say, it was just well known. He was known all over Rome as uh, um, uh, not just an evangelizer and a preacher, but very popular with the people. Like everybody loved St. Philip Neri. Uh, he must have, he was definitely a sanguine temperament. And anyone who came to him, it says he was all things to all people. For those who were sorrowful, uh, he would display genuine emotion, genuine emotions of sorrow for those people who needed it. And then, and then somebody else would come that was overjoyed, and he would really, really experience, really be able to share with that person their joy. Uh, so definitely the, um, uh, the, 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 the movement of the Holy Ghost in him, using his passions for what they are for. And, and, and really, I've, I've said this before in some of my classes, that everything God has given us, body and soul, is to be used properly. The mind is proper to know truth. Uh, the will, the heart, is proper to love what is good. And the passions, right, that which those, those emotions belonging to the body, are to be used in their proper service. And St. Philip Neri was doing that. Uh, he was using his emotions not to, to carry his will or his intellect, right? When we were fallen, we use our mind to rationalize why what I'm feeling is right. We're ang out of control, angry, we are uh, selfish, whatever it is, and then we rationalize why my passions are correct when they're not, they're sinful. But St. Philip Neri flipped that around. He would use his mind and his heart, this person needs help, or, uh, uh, and so I'm going to display, I'm going to feel, I'm going to enlist my emotions to help this person and display genuine emotion. Or uh, he would use his intellect, okay, because this is true, people need to know this. And so you use the passions to emphasize certain truths or, or others with either humor or, or, or forcefulness of a voice or even a, a, a small display of anger, whatever it may be, a controlled display. That's what the passions are for. And that's what St. Philip Neri was, uh, um, what was what made him so effective and, and then so powerful, we could say, in evangelizing. Um, and he wasn't happy, it wasn't enough that he would just minister to the people in Rome. Anybody who came to Rome, he also wanted to minister to. And so he founded a hotel for pilgrims coming for, to visit the churches for the Jubilee years, whatever it may be, as well as a convalescent home uh, for those who were um, released in the hospital, but still too sick to go back to work. He had a home for them to recover in. And so he would end up, uh, I think in one year, he hosted 180,000 people in his, um, in, his, in his home, his hotel, his pilgrimage place. Um, and he was given an old rundown church by the Pope. Uh, after a few years, they realized it was just beyond repair. So they raised it to the ground and built a new one in 1587 called Sant'Unitate dei Pellegrini at uh, Convalescenz, I think. And um, so that was built in 1587. <clears throat> uh, and it's really interesting because in 2008, Pope Benedict XVI gave that very same church to the Fraternity of St. Peter. And that's our church in Rome. So if you go to Rome and visit that church, San Trinitate de Pellegrini, the Fraternity Church, that's the very church St. Philip Neri was given 1587 by the Pope uh, with, with the, with the, that they rebuilt. So um, we have a connection, right? His, his way of life um, and his very church, uh, that fraternity uh, now cares for, modeled after. Um, and you know, with political involvement, this goes back to St. Philip's influence. Uh, Pope Clement VIII was in a tiff with Henry IV of France, we'll call it that. Uh, disagreement, he's been excommunicated and the, the, the king was Calvinist and the Pope excommunicated him. The, the king re renounced Calvinism, the Pope wouldn't lift the excommunication. There was political wrangling going on. So St. Philip Neri, he, he avoided political conflict if he could, but he saw that this was uh, the king of France. If he wasn't shown clemency, um, he was going to relapse. It would be very bad um, uh, uh, for, the, for the France and for the church. So the Pope's confessor, well, again, was a disciple of St. Philip. And so St. Philip Neri told the Pope's confessor, refuse the Pope absolution until he uh, reinstates the king. And if, he, if he's stubborn, uh, resign your post as his confessor. And so this is a cardinal. And so the cardinal did exactly that. And then Pope Clement, against all the advice of the, his other bishops and, and, and uh, um, advisors, uh, pardoned King Henry, and um, a great, you know, problem was avoided in, in, the, uh, in the world and in the church. So that, that shows the influence of St. Philip Neri. 
Now, where did all this come from, right? What was the source? What was the genesis? How did, how did St. Philip Neri do this, right? Like, what of his personal characteristics was just so productive of all this grace? Um, none of them, right? Nothing. All of that, all of his charm and his abilities, that wouldn't have, have accomplished anything were it not for the love of God in his heart. And, and that is uh, the, 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 the miracle, we would say, that perhaps for which St. Philip Neri could attribute everything is that once he was uh, praying in the catacombs, and um, you know he was very austere on it with himself. Uh, he he was um, uh, fastidious and he fasted and he prayed, spent much time in solitude, although he was with others. And so he would go down to these catacombs uh, in in the dark and the cold and in these pri you know conditions of privations, and that's where he would draw his spiritual strength. Other people, but he liked to see other people. Um, uh, enjoy themselves. Once uh, they would, he would bring good food and, and rich entertainment. He loved to hear people laugh and they would ask him, are you going to enjoy yourself also? And he used to say, um, your joy is all the happiness that I need. Right? So well, beautiful, beautiful words from St. Philip Neri. And where did he get that? He got it because in the catacombs he was praying. And this is after maybe uh, 20 years of living a life uh, totally dedicated to God. He had an extraordinary experience. He had a vision uh, of Christ or, or, or the Holy Ghost. I, I can't remember exactly which, but he saw a glowing orb uh, representing the love of God. And it, it, it appeared like in front of him and it hovered right in front of his mouth and then it entered into him and went down into his heart. And he felt an extreme, uh, we could say dilation of his heart. And uh, I think um, one account has him like running outside into the snow and pressing his heart into the snow to cool the heat, the burning sensation that he felt. Uh, it, w it was painful, but not unpleasant. Um, and in fact, afterwards, um, when they did an autopsy on St. Philip Neri after his death, they found he had a tremendously large heart. And in fact, two of his ribs had cracked uh, to make room for the expansive size of his heart. So that, is, that was the source physically, that physical miracle, a sign that the love of Christ had entered into his heart, and that's how he was loving uh, everyone else. Well, at his death in 1595, this is, the fe this is the feast of Corpus Christi. And on that very day, um, the body of Christ, right, he was told he was not in good health, and he spent the rest of the day hearing confessions and receiving visitors. And before going to bed, he said, and last of all, we must die. The very next day, he could not rise from bed. I uh, knew it was his last day on earth. And so his last request was for his close disciples to gather around him. And then he blessed them whom he called his spiritual sons. And then he died. And so this is a life well lived. This is all of us, right? When we, when we die, when we're on our deathbed, what do we want to be able to say we have done? We want to look back. And what we want to say is looking at our life, we want people to point to that and say, that was the life of Christ, right? That was how Christ uh, would have lived had he continued in the world. If Christ were in my position as, as a mother, a father, a husband, a son, a, a priest, a layperson, whatever it is, how would Christ have lived? We want to be able to say that on our deathbed, look back at our own life and say, I see Christ present in that life that was lived on earth. We ask for the uh, intercession of uh, St. Philip Neri to have this very grace. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.